This is a, a particularly exciting uh, day for us. It's not very often we have two state level secretaries stop by for a conversation. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this as informal as possible. Uh, but before I start in, I do want to plug a couple other things that are also relevant for you guys, for uh, uh, the audience that might be interested. We have a number of events this week and next week. And in fact, October is packed. Uh, later on today, there's another piece called The Metabolism of the Industrial City, Pittsburgh as a Model. Uh, the Engineer's Role in, in Reinventing a Sustainable Future is next week. Uh, there's a, another seminar why on, our, on why radionuclides are good for you. That's co-hosted with Mitchell Science Engineering. It's about nuclear technology. Uh, and we also are hosting an American Geophysical Union Connect workshop here. This is all on the Scott Institute website. Go look at it. If any of those things sound interesting, uh, please go sign up, come uh, and learn and share. So today, uh, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure to introduce uh, Secretary uh, um, Cindy Dunn and Secretary Leslie Richards. Uh, Cindy is the sixth secretary Secretary Dunn, I'm sorry, I'll keep it informal. No, Cindy's good. <laughs> Cindy's good. All right, we'll Go keep it in, it in the, in the uh, name of uh, informality. Uh, she's sixth secretary of the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, and she's returning to the agency where she worked for three different governors over uh, a number of the past two decades. Uh, not to, not to, uh, to, to put too, too fine a point on it. Uh, <laughs> she started she, in kindergarten. Kindergarten, exactly right, <laughs> yes. Uh, she's also done a number of other things, including the, being the executive director of the Audubon uh, Pennsylvania chapter and the Pennsylvania program director for the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay um, for 10 years. She's been recognized with many awards and done many exciting things, which uh, you can, of course, go look her bio up online um, if you're interested in more details. Uh, and it's important. I want to talk about both, both these folks, uh, where they started out. She uh, holds um, both a, a bachelor's and a master's degree in biology. She's a scientist. And part of, uh, we were just talking a couple seconds ago, part of her transition in this, this type of role was her love of the science and biology of, of the, the environment and understanding how to protect it best. And I'm going to ask you specifically about that transition in a bit. Um, Leslie, uh, in the private sector, served as a senior project manor, uh, uh, manager at a woman-owned civil engineering firm. And she uh, served as a public uh, involvement specialist in a consulting firm. She's done a variety of consulting and, and oversight, uh, I think, also for a, a while, right? And uh, she's a graduate of Brown University, where she uh, concentrated in economics. And then she also went uh, and got a master's degree in urban studies at Penn. Um, she uh, lives with her husband and three children in Montgomery County. And so without any further ado, let's uh, first welcome our guests. <laughs> And we have a couple of opening questions just to ask both of them, uh, and then a couple of other focus questions that we, can, that we can go through. I also want to elicit questions from the audience earlier rather than later. I'm hoping that once we get rolling, some of you have uh, relevant questions that we can uh, be conversational with. So I, I always want to involve the audience as much as possible. So uh, a couple of questions for both of you, first of all. Um, can you just talk a little bit about your roles in the Commonwealth, what you do, specifically what your day-to-day -day job is, and how it sort of relates to both each other and the, the grander sort of mission of the state? Okay, okay. I'll start. Uh, so I'm very excited to be leading PennDOT at this time. Uh, it's an agency with a $9 billion budget, 11,525 employees as of yesterday. And uh, we oversee the transportation network uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, it is the fifth largest DOT in the country when it comes to miles of roads. It's the third largest DOT in the country when it comes to number of bridges uh, that we maintain and operate. Uh, so it's a big, it, it, it's a big role. Uh, we are also, uh, we oversee and work with three of our ports, uh, one here in Pittsburgh. We also have a port in Erie and a port in Philadelphia. Uh, we do all uh, freight. Uh, we also oversee rail, uh, and that's passenger as well as uh, commercial use of rail. Uh, we have uh, over 40,000 um, miles of roadway that are state-owned, and that's not to mention our relationship with our municipalities where there's over 75,000 miles of roadway that are, are owned by municipal or county jurisdictions. Uh, we have bridges in there as well. Uh, we have uh, over 100 uh, local airports uh, that we also help. We flew into one today, uh, Allegheny County Airport. 
and, uh, and we are interested in all modes, which also includes uh, pedestrians, uh, bicyclists, and, and non-motorized vehicle as well, and access uh, to transit. And then there are the transit agencies, um, all the bus agencies, uh, the, tr the larger transit agencies, both in Pittsburgh and uh, Philadelphia, but also the smaller transit agencies uh, that exist in all of our counties as well as our um, shared ride uh, services uh, where we help uh, those with disabilities and seniors uh, get around. So basically we want to help you get to where you're going. Uh, we want to help uh, the goods and services that you need also uh, get to where it's going. And um, I am thrilled uh, at this time uh, to, to be part of Governor Wolf's uh, cabinet. I get to work with Cindy mm -hmm. and I get to work uh, with other people. Um, but I'm extremely proud to be in an agency that touches every single resident in Pennsylvania every single day. So whether you're walking uh, to transit or driving somewhere, you're walking on one of our roads uh, to get here, uh, there are state roads all, all around us, um, but also being able to work in new technologies is very ex exciting. I know we'll talk about autonomous vehicles and, and uh, cutting edge technologies that CMU has been a big partner with us. We've been able to work with all of our research uh, universities here in Pennsylvania significantly and uh, it's, it's just, it's just an exciting place to be. Hey, hi, too. I'm very happy to be here. It's an honor to be uh, asked to serve. I never turned down an opportunity to talk to young people. Uh, in, in my field, the field of conservation, uh, we are leaving a lot of significant conservation challenges to your generation. My generation is uh, striking out on a few of them, and uh, they're going to be in your lap. So I'm um, really anxious to, to reach out to young people when I can. The Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, DCNR, has existed actually well over 100 years in some format. Uh, Pennsylvania is a big forest state. Uh, we have a northern hardwood forest. It's uh, one of the most important parts of our economy. We are a big state park state. We have 121 state parks, national award winners for our park system. And we have one of the best conservation grants programs in the nation. We reach communities across Pennsylvania with trails, local parks, uh, et cetera. As far as state agencies go, um, Leslie mentioned her budget. Mine is about a third of a billion. So we're a smaller agency uh, as, as far as state government goes. Um, under, under the Go Governor Wolf cabinet, we all work together to try to achieve goals. So, you know, frankly, uh, logically a smaller agency aligned with a bigger agency can reach your mission and, and as Leslie said we work very closely together to achieve some of the trails and trail gaps and improve some of the parks in Pennsylvania. Um, we have an infrastructure for the engineering students. We, uh, we do have a large infrastructure in DCNR and uh, we're focused on improving our sustainability and our green footprint. A lot of our sustainability teams here uh, today but we have uh, 4,700 buildings, many of them built uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s without a thought at all to uh, energy use, water consumption. We have 3,700 miles of forestry roads and there's, through, through this 2.2 million acres of forest land in Pennsylvania, we manage a huge road system. We're right behind, I mean, we're second to PennDOT in terms of uh, miles of road that we need to manage this infrastructure. We have 125 dams. Uh, we have removed some. It was 145 just a couple of years ago. But many of these iconic dams form the nucleus of the uh, Pennsylvania State Park System. And uh, in managing uh, dams with changing climate and more deluge events in Pennsylvania is an expensive proposition. <laughs> we have a, a fleet of 1,600 vehicles. And uh, just yesterday, uh, we announced uh, the pilot we have with electric vehicles at the Capitol with uh, our wading into hybrid electric and electric vehicles. And we're uh, studying the impact and studying uh, the use of electric vehicles in our fleet, uh, thinking about the, the large fleet we have serving parks and forests. There's a huge opportunity there, both in terms of the real carbon save, but in terms of reaching the public. We have 40 million visitors a year in the state park system and the opportunity to tell a story uh, through our actions. Where all of our new buildings are sustainable buildings, high performance buildings, many are LEED certified. We have 15 LEED certified buildings. Anyone interested in uh, traveling out and about and seeing some of them? Ohio Powell State Park has a visitor center, which is a stunning example of a high performing LEED certified building. So, so when we do um, sustainability actions, it's not just for the carbon reduction, it's for the public story that we're uniquely poised to tell to a uh, visiting public. So we, we see that as a major part of our mission. Um, 
we, are, we have a trustee responsibility based in the Pennsylvania's Constitution. Pennsylvania is one of the states that has a, a constitutional uh, right to clean air, clean water, aesthetics, and access to the natural environment. So our trustee role is to 13 million Pennsylvanians of today and the Pennsylvanians of the future. So we're very much a planning future facing agency, both in the simple actions of managing a forest for 140 year rotation. I mean, the simple act of forestry when you're managing forest land for 140 year harvest rotation on the part of it that does get harvested to uh, our actions for uh, as trustee of the public lands. So that's uh, very much part of our, our mission, very much part of our work, and part of the uh, challenge of our day-to-day -day work. So I think I'll you know, stop with that and All right. open, hopefully. No, it's, it's both of you, great intros, thank you. So CMU is full of scientists and engineers, and many of us, I think, are kind of wondering, what's the role of science and engineering in your day-to-day -day jobs, or the decision-making that you mm -hmm. do? And some of us here focus on doing work to inform policy decisions, for example. Um, is that helpful? Do you listen to folks li like mm -hmm. those who do work at CMU? Uh, others of us work on things like autonomous driving or, or carbon emissions reduction or energy storage or whatever it might be, technologies that matter for your, um, your respective offices. Like, can you say a little bit more about maybe some examples or other situations or reasons why what goes on here is relevant to what you do? Mm -hmm. Sure. Anyway, it doesn't you want to go first? Come on. Uh, um, it's extremely relevant uh, to what we do. Our partnerships with uh, our academic institutions, and we have separate line items in our budget just for that and, and for research uh, partnerships. Uh, it's really important. Um, you know, things in, things in a DOT, you know, historically aren't known for moving at the speed of light, right? We have to take all the data, and we only move forward when we're co confident and, and, and feel good about the safety factor of everything that we do. And so, uh, in general, we're risk averse, and it helps us to have as much data as possible in order for us to make well-informed decisions. Obviously, um, with AV, with autonomous and connected vehicle uh, technology, we, we don't know what that is going to be. All I can tell you is I know that our transportation network in 2017 is not going to look like our transportation network in 10 years from now. Probably not in five years from now. And in 25 years from now, it is going to look very, very different. So what does that mean for us? And uh, we are uh, hoping that uh, you know, uh, the, the, the researchers out there are going to help us. What does that mean? Are we investing now? When I do a, a roadway project, that roadway, we are hoping, is going to have at least 40 years until it needs any type of repair work or anything going on, and hopefully longer than that. Well, is that road the type of road that an autonomous and a connected vehicle needs? Are we using the right materials uh, that we are going to need in 40 years from now when we come back and do you know, a major renovation. Uh, and, and that comes down to like our line paint. How does com a computer read that line paint? How does a human read that line paint? What type of technology is moving forward? And the auto industry that is developing uh, this technology right now, ev everyone's doing it differently, right? And then it's the data that we have that they have. Like, who's sharing that data? And, and trust me, when you go to an auto uh, manufacturer who, has, who is investing billions of dollars in this technology, they're not handing me a flash drive when I go in there and sharing everything uh, that they're doing. They, they want to hold on to that data, and rightfully so, because that's their business model. That is their business and, and what they're doing. And, um, so it's, it's really important that we, we, that we look at these broader topics, too. At, uh, at, at my agency, and I, I'm sure at most of the agencies in the Commonwealth, you're putting out fires every day. And I could do that every day long. That, 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 that could be, and when I wake up in the morning, I don't know what the rest of the day is going to be. When the Liberty Bridge uh, caught fire here, here in Pittsburgh, that, that had us all scrambling uh, for a while. That, uh, that was a, a huge problem. We had to bring in national um, uh, experts to help us solve that issue. And uh, so you don't know what's coming. And if you don't keep uh, that long-term perspective, that's all you could do. You could do that every single day. And then you would find yourselves 20 years from now thinking, gosh, I wish I had really thought about you know, what autonomous and connected vehicles were going to look like, because here it is now. And I was too worried about keeping certain bridges together. And I was too worried about keeping, keeping an old network together. Um, so we, we use science in all different ways. IT is, is, is very important now in a DOT, much more than it has ever been. And that's not just for uh, ITS and, and uh, autonomous vehicles. That's also um, 
You know, we're using it for mobile apps, keeping our inspection teams out on the road longer. We're doing app development. We're doing e-permitting with DEP so that we can uh, be better at project delivery and, and, and decrease the times that it takes to get a project done. Uh, we are looking at, uh, you know, we, we also have uh, financial uh, people and engineering uh, is, is a great mindset for that as well. It's hard to balance a $9 billion budget. So I need somebody who can easily see large numbers and, and, and assess them for us. And uh, the last thing I'll just say uh, so I can pass it off to Cindy is big data. Big data is a huge issue with us right now. We collect so much data. And uh, I'll be honest, we don't do such a good job of using all the data that we have. And when someone comes to me and says, oh, we can get you this other data, you know, my first reaction, I have to say, is we don't need more data. We, we, have, we have a tremendous amount. We, are one, we were one of the first, and I'm very proud of this because it happened under this administration, one of the first um, DOTs to partner with Waze. And we are one of the top five business partners with Waze, which, which, which tells you the size of us and, and, and size of Waze. We are getting thousands of pieces of data every four seconds from Waze, right? We're giving them data, and they're giving us data. We now get pothole data from them. We get road, uh, you know, smoothness of our road data from them. We also have other, it's Inrex and other that, that are giving us this data too. But we want to be able to use this data so that we can use at congestion modeling, so that we can see how our traffic flow can be better, so we can see where the freight corridors are, so we can direct people on the best times and most efficient ways uh, to get there. So again, there is just so much data out there, and um, we just need suggestions, and we need help from, from you in helping us uh, use it and use it in a smart way. Yeah, so just, I mean, thinking about DCNR uh, relative to what you said, we, we're an agency that uh, leans heavily on plan and planning. Uh, but because we're doing uh, recreation planning, we have partners, counties, townships, municipalities. Uh, we, we have a grants program. We, we lean heavily on, on plans. In terms of data, uh, we, we have a unit in our group that is not as uh, well known as perhaps as the state parks, topographic geologic services. So looking at the public trust, uh, responsibility DCNR has. When we get a hold of data, which we, with that unit uh, is all about data, we put it in the public trust. So we, we negotiate uh, with gas companies, for instance. We, we get the core borings from, uh, you know, the, their drillings, and we store them in core libraries so that other companies, we, we put it in the public domain. So again, we have a lot of raw material that's not even been translated to data mm. that is sitting there for someone to glean the data from, for then someone to glean uh, analysis and uh, comparison. So that gets put to a practical use, say, uh, recently. We were one of four states asked to do a, um, a, a, a study on the geology in, in West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and, Mar and Western Maryland on the, the gas storage potential, you know, with this cracker plant being uh, finished out here in Western Pennsylvania gas storage underground, uh, where are the opportunities in this whole Appalachian Basin? And so our topographic geologic services, uh, we have a Pittsburgh office out here on, on the island, uh, had done enough uh, data gathering and analysis of geology in western Pennsylvania, partly to serve uh, the coal and gas industry, partly to serve you know, other questions being asked by universities and others. But we had a good, um, reservoir of data. We'd done a sequestration study out here uh, years ago, and we had that data. So we were able to really contribute to this four-state study that was just released a couple weeks ago and just announced. And it shows the best opportunities in the Appalachian Basin for storage of these various um, elements, uh, var various uh, you know, fuel types. So that's, again, we're, we're gathering public data, put it in the public domain, is then useful for un some unforeseen future use. I mean, you know, back when we gathered the, the data, and of course, same thing out here, you know, over the last decades, we, we wouldn't have foreseen the use for this kind of storage. So, again, putting data in the public domain, we were the second that we followed Pendle on this one. We have an open data system, we, we have an open data uh, portal. Uh, we also gather a lot of data, like some of the things we're looking at right now in terms of climate change, uh, we're looking at the forests of today, which are changing. And it, it raises a lot of management questions, but we're getting data of the, ch the changes in forest composition. You know, with the way forests grow and, and operate, you, s you see the big trees, right? They're, they're there, and you can get the composition. We do it every five years. 
the new force is, just, is what's growing underneath and it's harder to analyze. And the, what are the changing forces we're seeing with, with climate change? We have a number of challenges with, uh, with invasive species, both plant and animal. We have a, a, a stunning array of forest pests that are removing huge whole species from the system. Mm -hmm. you know, green ash are being removed by emerald ash borer right now. Hemlock woolly adalgid uh, spreading into this area because of climate change. So, so data and analysis and, and, uh, is a big part of what we're doing. On the green energy side, we're aiming to solarize as many of our state parks as we can. So to make the public case for that, uh, understanding uh, you know, the, the solar capacity, you know, the, the right places we have, and the uh, energy we can get from that, and what, what part of that state park's operation can that solar array fulfill. For instance, we're looking at one right up the road, Moraine State Park. Anyone here been to Moraine State Park, just up the road, a great park to go to? Uh, we're looking at uh, putting a solar array at the sewage treatment plant there. Telling the story of uh, energy saved is going to be important. I mean, we're, the Governor Wolf's team is a very green energy friendly um, administration. If the next one isn't, the practical data on money saved is going to really matter. Uh, who's going to rip out something or not, not use something that, that is actually makes so much sense economically. So uh, that's just a few, there are a few examples of how, how we use and calculate data, but aside from data, we, we're an agency that plans. We have a five-year recreation plan, which we engaged with, uh, we had 10,000 people engaged with that one. We're a forest management plan, we're just starting. We have a state parks, uh, Pennsylvania, Penn's Parks for All plan underway right now. You can still, if you want to get online and get involved, you can have, th those of you who visit Moraine and other places can get online and give us input on how you'd like to see the parks of the future. We plan and, and we, we live uh, by those plans, so we're, we're big on that. Um, anyway, there's probably uh, many other ways we, we use data and engineering. Uh, climate change, you know, we're, we have to adjust our infrastructure to more deluge events. Uh, those, you know, 3,700 miles of roads, those bridges, those culverts, all that. Excellent. Uh, so I got a quick follow up. So it sounds like most of the data in, in your world is fairly publicly available. Yeah. Is, is that the case also with uh, DOT? Are you? A lot, I, yeah, yeah, a lot of, not all of it uh, for safety reasons, but a lot of it is available. And we also uh, have special relations. We, we have a very special relationship with CMU where we can release uh, other data as well. But, you know, as the requests come in, uh, I want to make as much data available as we can. And as Cindy mentioned, we both have open records that are available right now you can so go on our, our data open record um, websites and, and pull down you know a lot of data is available there mm -hmm. very good um, and something just came up that I was going to ask as a follow-on but I'll just put it pose it to you right now too and then maybe we'll open up the floor for a couple of questions uh, to, to give them a chance and it was the sort of the sense of sort of long-term climate change and how mm -hmm. it impacts your planning no question 10, 20, 30 years from now, things are going to be different. I've read a couple of different reports specific to Pennsylvania. How much of that is figuring in now to your decision making? Does it come up frequently? Uh, do you find it to be a politicized topic or not? And I don't want to be too political today, mm -hmm. but I do think it's an, this is an inherently political mm -hmm. question, but I do think it really matters. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that obviously there, there's a lot of change coming. Right. Maybe yeah. you, yeah. Well, with, um, you know, for, for us, uh, you know, I'm trying to think how to be less political about this. Yeah, I, just, um, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I do not want to make this a political conversation. <laughs> However, I, I think I, it's I, a I, very I important topic. Yeah. So, so I, when I came in as secretary, uh, there was a lot of fear in the agency to talk about climate change for, for a number of reasons, which I won't go into. Uh, our, our climate expert was like figuratively hiding under his desk. He changed his title, in fact. Um, and there was not open discussion of, uh, of the impacts of climate on our mission, and also as a conservation agency with a public trust responsibility for the air and the water and aesthetic and parks, we, we, we are charged to lead on this. We're, you know, we're not doing our job if we don't. And so um, we found it incumbent on us to, to take on this issue. So it's one of our six initiatives. We are launching this climate adaptation and mitigation plan, looking at every one of our units and how we can, uh, how we can face this issue and plan accordingly and act accordingly. So it, it, just, it touches every part of our agency. Number one, we're, we're on spot in the science. We, we have a, a climate uh, leader who's, who's excellent and knowledgeable and guides us and steers us and engages with the, you know, the, the smart thought partners looking at this in the future. 
Penn State is a, a big player in climate. We, uh, we relate to Penn State a lot, some of the climatologists up there. We're educating our staff. Uh, that you would think in a conservation agency that would be easy, but again, uh, not all staff are directly involved, so we're getting our staff educated through this process. We are, are environmental educators. We have about 100 educators who educate folks who come into the parks, you know, through programming, school programs and such. They're developing uh, educational materials around climate. And again, the attempt is not to politicize it. And, and the only request from me is that they point people to something they can do to, to get at really some of the, one of the problems with talking about climate is if, if you end, end your conversation in the wrong place, people feel hopeless and you, you, want, you want to push them towards action. And I think uh, you know, the affirmative actions we're taking with uh, our carbon footprint are, are just one example. Uh, the science is interesting for us on, on forest, the future forest of Pennsylvania, because it's a major part of Pennsylvania's economy. There's, uh, you know, the forest products industry is big in the state. It, totally depends on, on a healthy, productive forest, so planning ahead for the forest of the future is a, a real focus for us. And uh, we, we have a very strong um, forest planning unit that's looking at that issue, working with U.S. Forest Service, who's been a, a real leader there. And we have some uh, tough questions to, to tackle on that front. Uh, do, do you plan for and encourage the forest of the future and uh, willingly give up on the current forest we have, or do we do we try to hang on to the force we have today and, and really really fight to keep some of the composition mix that we have today? So it's a tough, tough um, issue. The good news about Pennsylvania is that uh, we're, we're a state that will have enough water for a while. The models show that uh, you know, Pennsylvania will, will get enough water. The challenge side of the water is that it, it'll come more and more in these deluge events. Uh, yeah, there's more, more moisture in the atmosphere. Uh, you know, Hurricane Irma, good, good uh, illustration of that. Um, so we have to plan for our rain coming in, in deluges, and that, that presents an engineering and a management challenge, both for the natural world and also for the built environment. The opportunity side of this is that green infrastructure, the use of more forest land, I mean, there's no better f land use cover than forest mm -hmm. to ameliorate the impacts of deluge rain. Uh, green infrastructure uh, used by the communities as part of their MS4 program required by DEP to, to put in more natural green engineering features to absorb and attenuate uh, stormwater. So we see it as a driving opportunity toward green infrastructure if we can uh, get the engineering right, get the data out there, make a convincing case that green infrastructure is effective and it works. And I think that's what we're trying to do. U.S. Forest Service is helping with that. You can, you can attach a nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment reduction value to trees. And uh, we're doing that in the Chesapeake Bay effort where we're planting forested riparians, you know, streamside trees that absorb uh, water flowing into Pennsylvania streams. Mm -hmm. So we've launched a, uh, a, a huge initiative to get 95,000 acres of uh, streamside trees established in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, for us, uh, we've, we've just undergone our first statewide resiliency plan where we've looked at all of uh, the assets in our transportation system and how vulnerable they are, mainly to flooding events. That's, that's a huge hit that we take in resiliency here in, in PennDOT. Uh, I asked when I first came on board, how much money have we spent just repairing uh, our assets uh, due to flooding events and the number's huge. Over 10 years we've spent $200 million and that's just repairing our assets. So we need to design better. We need to figure out ways uh, to make our infrastructure more resilient uh, to, these, to, to these events that, that we're seeing more. Storm Jonas, which happened just during um, you know, our administration, is the worst storm uh, that Pennsylvania has ever seen. It was more snow and it was extremely challenging for our winter operating crews uh, to clear the snow, keep all of our uh, roadways passable during that storm. Um, happy to report um, it, it, we were able to do it and no fatalities during that storm, which is quite, quite spectacular. And um, so uh, how we move ahead uh, is, is looking at everything. On the national uh, front, you know, I'm working very closely with California that has to deal with uh, slo slope stabilization, land, uh, slides, we have that. That's a big problem here in Pennsylvania. So we're trying to learn from them. You know, how are they, um, 
you know, how are they anchoring their assets differently than we are, and, and how are they surviving uh, some of these events, and uh, do we need to change some of our design uh, that we use here? We work with Delaware very closely on sea level rise. I mean, uh, the, the less and less land uh, is going to be available, and that means, you know, roads are disappearing and other things uh, will be disappearing, and uh, how, are we, how are we looking at that? Uh, as far as the political aspect of it, I was uh, surprised by this, but really I shouldn't have been. Early on, um, I was selected to be the chair of the, the Resiliency and uh, Sustainability in Transportation Systems Council, which is the national. And uh, there, there are certain committees and a secretary of, of, of transportation in a different state is the chair of all of these committees. With my background, which is environmental, they had asked me to chair this. I was very excited about it. And as I was talking about it, I mentioned climate change. Well, unbeknownst to me, uh, the majority of my committee doesn't, doesn't say climate change. They don't talk about it that way. And uh, so that was very eye-opening uh, to me. Doesn't mean we can't work on the same issues. We just have to find a language that we are comfortable with uh, in working together. Uh, as uh, Cindy mentioned, you know, our just you know, you don't have to look back very far. Just a few weeks when you look at what's happening, what happened in Texas, what happened in Florida. We're going to see more and more of that. We need to to work closely together. And uh, you know, it's not a surprise to you. Those are two of the states that don't like to use the words climate change. But uh, they need to address this issue, what, however they want to talk about it, infrastructure resiliency, however we want to talk about it, it is something that is impacting all of us. And so we have to you know, be careful and make sure that, uh, you know, that we still move forward on this. Otherwise, uh, you know, our, our transportation networks are going to find themselves in really, you know, really bad and vulnerable uh, status uh, not, in not too far in the future. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. So I think now I'm going to uh, punt once, uh, twice to the audience. Does anyone have a question they want to pose to either of these? Yeah. Here. Come here. Great. Yes. Um, so uh, as a as a student, uh, as I hear about um, climate change and the different questions back and forth and how polarizing it can be politically. Um, it seems such a matter of incentives. So like on one hand, the business incentive to not believe in it and just keep doing whatever makes more profit. Um, and then on the other hand, the scientific side of like um, it, the you know results that we're finding in general. But um, I guess how do you communicate those incentives to incentivize being sustainable and to address that issue of like incentives on both sides driving one person to not believe in climate change and another person to be a strong advocate for it. Sure. So, yeah. so Dialogue, I guess. I mean, I can start first. So it, it always helps when you're making an argument. You do look at the bottom line. You know, what is this costing? It costs PennDOT $200 million um, over 10 years, and that's a lot of money. We could do a lot of other projects with that money. So that's, that always helps, especially when you're, you're talking to the policymakers and when you're talking uh, to the legislators who are, who are working on that. Uh, you have to be careful on your messaging, and it's something that is so important, and I can't say this enough, especially when you're working with a lot of technical people. Take the time that it needs to think about how you are communicating an idea. Right. It's not, and if you have an audience with somebody who is a big decision maker, prepare. Don't go in there and say, oh, I'm going to talk about all these different things. Really think about what is it that you want to leave them with? What is the idea? Uh, and I, I, I have stepped in, um, you know, some muddy waters here, right? I have not. I, 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 I've learned because I have made mistakes. I want to share them with you, so you don't have to make those mistakes. Uh, I spoke about a uh, environmental issue that we're working on alongside one of our interstates, and I got pummeled because they expected we get our funding from a gas tax. And it's very controversial, right? People don't want to spend more money, and, and, and that's how our funding comes in. And they were furious that their money that was supposed to go to transportation was building what they considered to be a park next to one of our assets. Mm -hmm. And what I did not do well the first time around, luckily I got another chance to do it, is I let them know that that's our environmental mitigation. That's something that we're required to do uh, for, by Federal Highway. That's how we get a lot of our funding for these projects. And when I told them that if we did not partner with this city and with this private nonprofit and with these private businesses on building this park, which is providing our stormwater and environmental mitigation on this project, 
Otherwise, PennDOT would have had to build, first of all, an ugly stormwater basin or some other type of stormwater management best practice, and um, it would have been fully on PennDOT's budget. So we were actually getting a deal. But I didn't see, th I was so excited about this park and I was so excited about what it was going to do to the quality of life of this community, which is all very exciting. But people are coming at you uh, from, different, from different areas. Another um, project where I did a lot better uh, getting out in front of it is along I-95, uh, which is one of our heavily, most heavily used corridors here in Pennsylvania. And we are building uh, rain gardens along uh, I-95. Because when I-95 was built uh, many decades ago, it literally bisected uh, communities. And you have community. We have one place on I-95, which is amazing to me, where there is a park on either side of this I-95. And you cannot, the kids from this neighborhood can't play with the kids from this neighborhood. And they each have like less than half of a park. So they don't feel so great about this park either. But that's just the way it was. And that's how uh, a lot of interstates just block off communities from the waterfront. They block off communities uh, from other areas here. In Pittsburgh, it's not hard for you to imagine. When I go in other areas, it, it's harder to explain. And so we're putting money into these rain gardens. And it is helping uh, the businesses that are located right up against uh, this, this big structure. And a lot of I-95 is up on structure. Um, but it's also helping, helping our communities, helping with stormwater, and it's helping the bottom line. Uh, we, are be, we are able to do that in the most cost-effective way. So whenever you can put those, uh, you know, all of those dots together, uh, you'll, you'll be m more successful. Yeah, I'd say our approach is, is very similar. We work with a number of uh, entities in DCNR, and so when we deal with the forest product industry, again, not an industry that's out there saying we've got to do something about climate change, but an industry whose future, in fact, is highly dependent on that. I think we, we talk about the things that matter to them, the to change in their uh, raw product. But it's always been interesting to me to look at other campaigns, uh, because as this climate change, get, getting the public to understand the importance of climate change, given the urgency, is, is, is really kind of like a campaign. Um, yeah, you look at the, the, dr the DUI, the drunk driving thing. You know, the, you know, the Mothers Against Drunk Driving, all, all these efforts to uh, let the public know how dangerous drunk driving is and keep people from doing it. And the campaign uh, that was launched a couple of years ago s was DUI, you can't afford it. It was it really went to the bottom line. I thought, well, that's interesting. I just can't imagine someone thinking that way, but it was effective, apparently effective campaign. Mm. You know, so, so when you look at um, climate, you could say that about climate change. Climate change, you can't afford it. I mean, that, that would be the perfect slogan for climate change. We really can't afford it in so many levels. But uh, we don't really talk about it that way. But when, when, um, when the public is being fed such um, misinformation, you, you look, well, what's behind that? And so you see uh, a, a, a campaign uh, being run by those who feel their interests would be harmed by the public grasping climate change, the carbon interests. You know, and they, they fuel the Koch brothers. They, the ad, you know, they, they, had, they had a campaign to keep people from understanding the danger of tobacco. And a, a misinformation campaign that went on for decades. It resulted in a lot, loss of life across uh, this country, fueled by misinformation. So the same thing has happened, uh, you know, in, in, in the climate issue. There's some of the information out there is misinformation fueled by a certain interest. Not all of it, but in some of it's honest discussion. So you just have to uh, really tease apart and understand some of the some of the tide that's pulling the other way is, is not honest data and not honest information. But um, basically, I think the economic argument's a good one. I know for us, you know, when we have to spend money, we had uh, two two one thousand year floods and a small watershed in Loyal Stock State Forest happened five years apart. Thousand year floods, five years apart. Hmm. But anyway, we lost. We lost six miles of road. They go into a neat part of the forest where there's a trail, and there's cabins, and everything else. We won't be able to rebuild it. It was obliterated. We lost a number of bridges. Uh, Pendant lost a number of bridges. Again, we, you know, it's, it's a hit we can't afford. We're going to spend over two, $10 million bringing back some of the bridges and some of it, but we just we can't afford it. You know? So I think, I think the financial argument is a good one to make because it's apparently effective in other campaigns. Great. We have a question from the uh, peanut gallery. Do you want the mic, Jay, real quick since we're recording this? <coughs> Thanks. Thank you, Jay. Question uh, for Secretary Dunn. 
we did some work a uh, number of years ago looking at decommissioning funds for energy projects on state lands in various states. Okay. Pennsylvania's was pretty low, and it, it was pretty clear this was during the Corbett administration that the administration wasn't interested in having adequate decommissioning funds for energy projects on state lands. <laughs> Has uh, the Wolf administration any ideas to address uh, decommissioning wind turbines, uh, uh, hydraulically fractured uh, gas wells, other energy projects, even the gathering lines? One thing I can say to speak to that, um, we, we have gas leases on state forest land. There's, there's currently a moratorium on new leases because we felt that at the moment about a third of the state forest lands are available for gas drilling, either because we don't have the mineral rights or because we did the uh, leases in 08 and 10. Um, those leases um, have strong language that require bonding and decommissioning. It's, it's actually it's pretty low compared to the actual cost of decommissioning. And it looked to us as if the state was going to get stuck with I would love to. Where? I, you know, I need to become more educated now. That's information that I, w I would like to uh, to have more access to. I, I have not seen that information because what's happened over time, and we're 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 carrying the price tag for the uh, coal mining on, that happened on state lands or lands that were later transferred to the state after they've been coal mined. There's 35,000 acres of abandoned mine land in the state forest land system. Um, the, fe the federal abandoned mine land program is, it supplies a regular stream of money. I hope, I hope that stream of money continues in the Trump administration. But they have supplied a, a regular stream of funding from abandoned mine land funds uh, that we've tried to take advantage of to restore some of these abandoned mine lands. But I would say that we, it's a slow and steady process. We just, um, with DEP, were able to recover some in the Sproul State Forest, you know, above Renova recently. But again, 35,000 acres is a lot of work. And, and, and another expensive decommissioning was a uh, nuclear plant, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> that was operated um, up in Quihanna. Interesting, uh, interesting story. But we had a, a, we, the state system, at Penn State ran a, a nuclear facility. Uh, and it was turned over to the, the past DCNR was forced in waters at the time. And we had an expensive nuclear decommissioning on state forest lands. It's now now wilderness, so. We'll make sure to get you. No, I'd like to see, yeah, they. Two years old. Maybe. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the, the story of Pennsylvania has been putting it in the public lap, you know, the, the funds needed to clean up, uh, you know, things of the past. Good point. Grant? Hi. Well, I just lost my mic. Uh, use your yeah. Use your microphone. Got it. So, Secretary, thanks for your leadership. We really appreciate your remarks today. I have a, a simple question, and then I'm going to give you a couple examples. What are some of the best ways in which your efforts can align resources for local communities? So, you started out your remarks talking about the Ohio Pow, about mm -hmm. Ohio Pow, and I was there a couple weeks ago, and it's a shining example, I think, of where a local community, DCNR and PennDOT join together to invest in the community and make a huge impact mm -hmm. in terms of not just the aesthetics of the community but also the functionality of the infrastructure. You've also talked about climate change and water and energy. So here in Pittsburgh, water is a huge issue for us, mm -hmm. particularly stormwater. Roads are the number one contributor of the flow of stormwater. And Secretary, you mentioned the idea of design. And then also in terms of energy, transportation makes up about 20% of our carbon footprint within the city of Pittsburgh. So how can a community best work with your efforts to help align resources to solve some of these big challenges? Yeah. Wait, and before, could you please introduce yourself to the general, and most people may not, or some might may not know who you are. I'm I think Grant. Grant, who, <laughs> from where? <laughs> I'm Grant Irvin from the city of Pittsburgh, and I serve as the chief resilience officer for the city. Wonderful. So it's a selfish question. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a great question. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm the first female to lead PennDOT, but I'm also the first planner, and my background's in environmental planning. Mm -hmm. So our initiative under the Wolf Administration, which is my signature, you know, one of, one of my very proud accomplishments here, and, it, and it's a team effort, I, I, one of our proudest accomplishments, is an initiative called PennDOT Connects. 
and we've been working very closely with Pittsburgh. Obviously, we've been working very closely uh, with all of our municipalities. And what's at the core of PennDOT Connects is that every dollar we invest in one of our assets, and we invest over two and a half billion dollars a year just in the construction phase. That's not even including what we, we do on the design and getting to the construction. One, two and a half billion dollars a year uh, in construction uh, projects. Every dollar that we invest in our asset is a dollar we invest in our communities that host that asset. So for the first time ever, we are having very early conversations where we look at comp plans, open space plans, economic development plans. We have conversations with the borough managers and township managers. We want to know what their goals are, how they see their community, how do they want their community to grow. And very often, our asset, whether it's a road, a bridge, a trail, um, a sidewalk, it, it can be a variety of things. Uh, airport, it could be um, how, uh, how close it is in proximity to a freight carter coming through, uh, where the rail is, where public transit is. How are we looking at that? Is this asset used to help connect and, act and, and provide access to transit? Is this asset used for recreation as well as to get good and services and people to work? Uh, why do people want to live uh, in this community? Is PennDOT a part of that? And so we want to work with our communities. We want to see what their goals are. I'll give you, you know, a quick example. We were working on a roadway project up in the Lehigh Valley. Normally, and what has been done for years when we go in and we fix this project and, and we make the upgrades that uh, we, we need to do, we build a safety wall to keep the vehicles on this roadway, which is next to a very steeply uh, sloped um, area. Now we were going about it again, going over the design. Well, because of these PennDOT Connects discussions, we realized that the county as well as the municipalities have wanted to build a multi-use trail right next to our asset. And that helps us because everyone who decides to bike along that corridor or walk along that corridor takes a car off of that corridor, which helps us with congestion. We want to give people options uh, to where they're getting. As many connections as we can make, uh, again, with as many options as we can provide is helpful for us. So because of those discussions, we're now building a retaining wall instead of just a safety wall. And they can use that then in their corridor design. They're going to be able to build that corridor two to three years before they would have been able to if we hadn't coordinated with them in that way. Uh, so again, these are discussions we haven't had before. We need to know, you know, what residential developments do they see, uh, what, what's, what's coming in, what are their land use patterns, what businesses do they, do they feel will come in. Warehousing is becoming a huge, uh, you know, a, a huge pattern and, and we're, we're welcoming it. It means more business. Um, Pennsylvania, and I did not know this before I got into this uh, position, 7.5% of all freight in the entire country goes through Pennsylvania. We are between the, the freight corridors of D.C. And, and New York and Boston, but also from New York to Chicago. Those are two of the heaviest traveled freight uh, corridors and connected to some of the largest ports, and, and they all come through uh, Pennsylvania. So we have to take a look at that and how are our assets helping that or or being obstacles uh, in that. In Pittsburgh, we've loved working on smart city innovations as well. My background, what got me into transportation was air quality issues as well. So obviously, we're always looking to reduce emissions. How can we do everything uh, better? So, th so those conversations are taking place now at a level and at, 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 um, at a um, detail that they have never before. So we're, we're, we're going to continue that. And of course, our relationships with our municipalities are very important to us. So the more we work together, the more they have the conversations, uh, the better. It's also allowing the funding questions that always come up. Look, PennDOT can, can do so much, and we want to do as much as we can. But we always have limited resources. So even building that retaining wall um, increased the price significantly on that asset. We were able to do it, and, and it's the right thing to do. Not always do we have the funding resources to do it, so we can have those conversations with the municipality, with the businesses in the air area, see if we can get innovative funding, have those conversations early on, seeing what grants are, mm -hmm. are available mm -hmm. through DCNR and other, uh, and other agencies as well, so that we can help put that all together and, and, and get it done. It's, it's always you know, a complex uh, problem to solve.
You know, one, one of the best parts of my job is, is to pollinate good ideas from one place to another. And I have to say, here in Pittsburgh, you know, Grant, uh, you know, leadership and with the, the mayor, we, we learn a lot and that we move that around to other communities. But I think uh, one thing we learned recently, which was interesting, uh, Mike Wallace, our, our deputy who does our sustainability work, pointed out that Pennsylvania is this 2030 <coughs> district. You know, all the businesses, the PNCs, the highways, developers, all that had signed on to this 2030 district to reduce you know, energy consumption in that footprint uh, by 50% by 2030. And Point State Park, this iconic, lovely state park there at the point was not part of it. So we, again, we thought, well, we, we can't miss this. So we got on that, uh, uh, got on your train, and now we're part of the 2030 district. And the work we do there at Point with solar, with uh, green infrastructure, the demonstration green infrastructure project there at Point will be seen by millions of people and will help spawn that thinking elsewhere. Pittsburgh, you know, back uh, in the Tom Murphy era, really devoted to making trails along the, the rivers. And so the, the, this grown out, those of you who are enjoying those riverside trails, that came out of uh, you know, a past mayor who attracted investors from the state, our agency in fact, um, to invest money in, in the trails all around Pittsburgh along the riverfronts. And that actually spawned a movement across Pennsylvania, we were able to take that and, and really talk to other communities about, you know, use that asset. You talk about an asset, a river. All, well, most of Pennsylvania's communities are built along rivers and streams. They, turn, they had turned their back to these great rivers and streams because the rivers and streams were dirty from coal mining, from pollution, from raw sewage. Now that they're more and more cleaned up, the cities are facing the streams and using uh, those greenway corridors along the rivers and streams as an asset to spawn and attract more development. So Pittsburgh was leading the way there, and again, we were able to pollinate that thinking elsewhere. We have a grants program that was just under fire today in the Capitol right now, and the way here is making phone calls to some in the legislature, the House Republican Caucus, are trying to s steal the funds to balance the budget. So our, our stakeholder, in fact, I would like the mayor to make a couple calls if he would, um, <laughs> to um, take these funds. But these funds are critical. They match community funds and put in segments of trails and put in little local parks and such. It's uh, a fund started in, uh, in 1993 called the Key 93 Fund. So. Again, we're able to, through our grants program, to meet community needs, but also to lead them and give them ideas. And so any of you uh, that find yourselves placed in a, a company somewhere that's doing any riverfront development, you know, look at that riverfront, naturalize the bank, you know, bring, bring back nature in, in, in the first segment, the buffer area, and then a trail, and then, and then the business. And that, that'll make the business or the residential area much more uh, much more valuable and much more attractive for workers and for residents than anything else. And Pittsburgh is, it really leads the way in, in that initiative and is a shining example. So again, uh, yeah, we're able, we're, we're pleased to be able to help and sometimes we lead, sometimes we follow, but we always, uh, we always take the good ideas and pass them around Pennsylvania. So. Great, so maybe one more question from the audience and I've got a wrap up question. Our time is, uh, is going quick, me? so I wow. read. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Yeah. Uh, I work in the technology transfer office here, so I help uh, people who are interested in creating startup companies. What advice would you give them in terms of partnering with your agencies for doing pilot projects or for procurement? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Share your ideas with us. I just had a, a company come in yesterday, which was fantastic. So. Uh, first of all, uh, please have a conversation with us and know what problems we're trying to solve, uh, and there are multiple of them, you know, uh, of problems that, that we need help on. One of them is in diversifying our workforce. Uh, it, is, it is particularly uh, improving diversity in construction. And this is something that everybody agrees we should do, but nobody knows how to do it, and, and nobody knows what to do, and a lot of people are spinning their wheels. There is a new company uh, that, that just started. They're less than a year old, and they are creating games uh, for middle schoolers and high schoolers to play. And during these games, you get to you know, drive a construction truck. You get to see what a cement mixer does. You get to understand what surveying a construction site looks like. You are um, introduced to people on the construction site who look like you know, uh, look like you, right? There are females, there are minorities, there, um, there are men. Um, and <laughs> I know that yeah. sounds silly, but um, 
So it's, it's, it's fantastic. And uh, you know, I always say when you have the diversity conversation, you know, we have white men, uh, construction workers, who fully believe in diversity. And this is a problem that impacts all of us because it impacts you know, uh, the bottom line here. And, and it's amazing. So we're hoping to get this game into the hands of middle schoolers because we know that's where they need to consider different things. And, uh, and we think that that is going to be a, a great way. In addition, as they earn badges through this game and they earn um, you know, uh, points through the game, those points, if they get to a certain level, and there's certain levels that use a lot of math, right? We don't start off with saying, hey, you got to be good at math to consider these types of, uh, of careers. But if you get to certain levels, it means that they understand and they can analyze and they use math and calculations and everything. Then that data will be shared with us. And we will reach out to them, letting them know about apprenticeship programs, letting them know about transportation. So that's just an idea it came to us. They knew that we were working on diversity. They knew that we were trying to improve construction. So just, just knowing what the problems are, and then we will listen uh, to anything that you have uh, to help us solve. It. And same thing for us. I mean, I think we're, um, again, state procurement uh, work is, is difficult at times. We're, there's an initiative underway for diversity in procurement. I mean, Mike was an all-day meeting, I think, yesterday about that. But we, we have, uh, we can demonstrate small-scale things in a state park and public lands. I mean, public lands are a great place to start. We have an initiative for colleges and universities called Think Outside where we're encouraging experimentation, encouraging data, encouraging work on the public lands. These are lands owned by you. Uh, so they're open to you. We're, we all own 2.2 million acres of forest land. We all own 121 parks. So there's implicit in our mission is the ability to learn and operate things. So uh, th there are rules, I mean, because there are, you know, there's a lot of other people who own these, so <laughs> we have to manage things. But for instance, we're in a conversation about you know, using the kinetic energy on the state park lakes, you know, you know, little waves that bounce up and down. Well, there's kinetic energy there. Can that be captured and used in any meaningful way? You know, solar, I mean, this micro hydro, um, just demonstration level technology that has a public good can be looked at on public lands, whether it's in the college or university setting through, think out, through the portal of Think Outside or whether it's in a business sense through, um, our procurement. So to, 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 to do that, I, I really like Leslie's advice, understand what problems we're trying to solve, or come to us with a great idea. Sometimes something real innovative and different requires executive level look to try to help navigate the, uh, the systems in place in state government that uh, are you know, implicit in the design of state government. But we, uh, you know, we're definitely open for that kind of discussion. And just real quick, if someone does have, wants to reach out to one of your offices, what's the best way to do it if they have something along those mm -hmm. lines? Is there a, obviously you're not going to entertain a personal email, right? No, we do actually all the time. Yeah, <laughs> really? You can send us the personal email. I say for me, if you don't hear back from somebody within a, a you know, within two weeks, I, I can't say I will personally return that email, but I will pass it on. Yeah. Uh, if it does not, you know, if you don't hear back, you're, you're, not, you're not bothering us, send it again. Because there are some emails, I mean, I get over yeah, a thousand emails a day. Yeah. So I can't, I can't always, you know, I have four people reading my email. So also don't like do anything inappropriate in the email because I have yeah. other people <laughs> reading my email. But, um, you know, that's how we manage everything. And that's the only way we can, we can get it out. And I, and, and I do want to see it. I want to see what the idea is. And I want to make sure it gets to the right uh, team member. And our sustainability team is 65 people. Uh, it's one of our six strategic initiatives, and, and probably you know, your idea would give that team okay. to have a look. That's great. All right, so uh, we don't have a lot of time left. And uh, the, I think we have so many students in the room, and, and one of the questions I think that maybe on many of their minds is how do they get from where they are in that seat out there to something like where you are now? Uh, and I think this is relevant to all students, but particularly to the women out there who uh, they, they're going to see you as real examples. So what advice, observations about your own career arc and what it's like to be a woman in science engineering policy, uh, that kinds of things? Like, what do you feel about that? And what advice would you give? Yeah, sure. So if you don't have it all figured out, don't worry. I did not have it. Maybe Cindy had it all figured out at this age. I didn't have it. I, I, was, I, was, I was in city planning, right? And I was uh, interested in, in, in air quality issues and eventually led me to transportation. So I did not know at this age what I wanted to do. Um, so don't let, you know, don't let that, uh, that scare you. And, and, and really step outside of your comfort zone, start things. Just because you are not doing something 
uh, directly related. Uh, everything you do, you know, is, is a connection. What a lot of people don't know, I was a stay-at-home mom for eight years. I worked part-time uh, for the majority of my um, of my career. Uh, the way for me that I was able to get back into things and build up my network very quickly was I got active in my community. I served on my park and rec board. I served on my planning commission. I ran for township supervisor. I was a county commissioner. Uh, my networks through politics, I will say if you have any interest in politics whatsoever, whether it's running yourself or um, you know, helping a candidate, uh, speaking uh, on, on issues, uh, it is extremely helpful. The networks that will be open to you there really open things up. You could go to every single thing your firm sends to you. You could do, go to every conference, and uh, you will not get the rich network uh, that you can get. I, I feel anyway that you can get through that. So uh, I offer to do that. Be yourself. Just because you don't see anyone that looks like you uh, at the top does not mean that you cannot get there. Definitely seek out uh, advice uh, from others mm -hmm. and work as a team as well. Um, help others propel up and, and that I think is one of the most useful things you can do. I had no idea. I helped uh, a uh, former president of a company that I work for you know, become president and little did I know that she was in charge of a large trade organization that recommended who should be in this position to the governor. Right? I did not do that. I just give you that as an example. But um, do things that um, with good intentions, right? That that yeah. that feel good to you. I, I did not do that because I thought I would be in this you know role at some point in my life, and I did not, you know, I didn't become a township supervisor because I wanted to become a county commissioner. That was an opportunity that then I, I didn't even know about that opportunity. I did not work for a civil engineering firm and an environmental enge engineering firm, hoping one day to become the secretary of transportation. Like opportunities will present themselves, ones that you are not planning for. I thought my long-term goal was to be the president of a civil engineering firm. That's what I was working towards and was very excited uh, on that. But then I got sidetracked and had, had different uh, you know, opportunities. So that is always good. And uh, so really, be yourself. Don't worry uh, if uh, you're, you're not quite sure what's going on. Um, People understand if you have genuine intentions, and people always appreciate uh, when you help others and, and when you're nice to others. Never feel like you are, um, there, there's enough. There's enough great stuff to do. And never feel that you're going to um, you know, make the competition uh, too strong and limit your own opportunities. I have never found that to happen. There is uh, enough wonderful things to do here where we can all you know, rise together and do it. No, that really resonates with me, everything you've said. And I, my goal in life was to be a biologist. I, I wanted to be that biologist that understood uh, a taxa group, whether it was fungi, whether it was you know, some, some side branch, the insect taxa, and, and be the person that really helped with that. And, and it's just the urgency of the conservation work always pulled me into something more advocacy, more education, more policy oriented. And because I was passionate about biology, you know, that drove me to be, being the hard worker. I mean, I don't, I don't think I was blessed with the great brain. I've, I have a younger brother who had the brain in the family. He's the engineer. I'm, it was just hard work. And so it was always understanding the organization and the boss of even the small nonprofits I was working for. Like, what, what's this organization trying to do? What's my boss trying to achieve? And to be that's the smart worker that helps guide and gives good advice has information that you know, the hard worker that shows up and actually has something to offer uh, and, and help you know you help move your organization and so my, my personal interest became really engaging more and more people with the environment and conservation so this is obviously a really good platform for that so I think my interest in that though is what drove me to move up in government in my various government roles and again, it, it, and, it, and when I was selected for various jobs, it wasn't, I was selected over people that had more experience per se in that unit. I, I was selected to be a bureau director over four division chiefs, all, all men, all very good professionals, all who had been in that world, you know, decades and, and knew a lot about the, the substance per se, but I, I had a little more vision, I think, and a lot of, a lot of more passion for the, the overarching goal of that particular bureau. So I just think nothing replaces hard work, but if you're doing that hard work and no one knows it, that doesn't help either. You have to offer it. And that's, that's where it's kind of like the, the queasy feeling in your gut where you think, yeah, does, does anyone really care? Is anyone interested? 
you know what? They may not the first time, <laughs> you know. And you gotta say it again and say, well, you know, just just keep pushing it. And you know, even if you think like people are making fun of you because you're always the person who says something, you know what? That it's okay to be different and and, and to be known as a person saying, hey, we gotta, you know, we gotta engage more with the public, or we need to pay more attention to this data. We, you know, I think that's that's fine. And be yourself. I would totally echo what Leslie said. And I never like like her. I never set out to become the secretary of an agency. It's just the, the division sort of drafts you in a direction and, and um, that being known as a person who, who really produces, I think, really makes a difference. And I think uh, if you won't be happy unless you're following your passion. You know, you can't, you can't like chart out a course that you think you should do or your parents think you should do or your partner thinks you should do. You know, you really got to feel it in your heart, and you won't you won't know it every day. I still have in mind to be a biologist. I mean, so I may <laughs> I haven't given up on that one. I, I may go. I actually get on Cornell Lab of Ornithology and look at the courses and think, oh, how many more would I need to get the PhD in ornithology? So, you know. Excellent. So uh, perseverance, passion, and mm -hmm. uh, comfort with risk, perhaps, yes. uh, yeah. and just go out there and, and uh, head for it. This is uh, mm -hmm. similar advice I think we all try and give our, our young people. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Fair Before I, we, we formally thank you, I do want to mention uh, the associate director of Scott Anasifkin was uh, one of our associate directors. Anasifkin was very instrumental in, in putting all this together. She worked really hard. She had a death in the family this week, and it has been, uh, you know, very traumatic. Uh, so we're, all our thoughts are with her, and I, I really hope that, uh, you know, she comes back and is uh, well adjusted next week or the week after. And I want to thank her along with these two for organizing and attending this event. So thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.